All right, shout out to Jen Cole for the awesome hat. Thank you. Make sure to check out her Instagram, The Joyful Projector. Shout out to Jenny V for the different strokes for different folks mug. Excuse all the coffee on it. I use this mug a lot. Uh, make sure to check out her Instagram, everyone underscore is underscore different with the number one. Today we're going to be uh, doing part six of our locks and keys. I'm never sure if I'm going to make it through one of these when I sign myself up to do multiple in a series, you know, it's like worst thing for a generator to do to announce that they're going to, you know, for a generator with an undefined ego to initiate a new series. And then the moment I initiate it, I go, why did I do that? But thankfully, um, you know, this is a really interesting topic to me and it keeps coming up for me. So it kind of gives me opportunities to respond um, so I'm not just sitting there going, oh, people want to hear the next one. I better do it. I better make it happen. That's the worst feeling as a generator. You know, you don't want to be in something feeling like you're obligated, like you have to do it, feeling like, you know, you promised you would do it and you have undefined ego. Not a good feeling. Luckily, uh, in this case, you know, <laughs> it's an interesting topic and, um, you know, it's something where when I have a few minutes to sit down and I want to kind of sink my teeth into something new for me as well, that I can fire up the, the webcam and I can do a little bit of analysis. So that's what I'm going to do today. So today as part six, we're going to be looking at, uh, this is going to be gate seven and gate seven is called the leader. And this is logical leadership. Last, last week we looked at, um, Gate 13, which is also leadership, but that's abstract leadership. It's a very different kind of leadership. The abstract leadership of Gate 13 is based on having the experience. The logical leadership of Gate 7 is based on making accurate predictions. So you might trust a Gate 7 leader, even though they have no experience, because of their track record. So many of their predictions are good, one after the next. You look at all their predictions, you go, wow, you've made some really good predictions. I'm going to trust your prediction here even though you have no experience in this area. 13 is all about the experience. They say, you're really gonna trust that gate seven? That person's never even driven a car and you're gonna trust them for advice on how to race this course? How, you know, how, you know, don't you wanna trust me? I actually have the experience. So gate 13 is all about the experience. Gate seven is about the predictions. Now we can see that at a global level when we're looking at global cycles, 13 is about how we understand history. Seven is about how we prepare for the future. It's about looking towards the future. When we, with 13, we look to our past and the key to 13 is the key to helping us understand our past, right? So the key to 13 was gate 61. We saw how gate 61 was occult knowledge or is occult knowledge and how that door is closing. Our ability to understand our past through occult knowledge is going away. What we're gaining is gate 54, the ability to understand our past in terms of ambition, drive, and mundane interaction. Well, this is the same theme, but for the future instead. And of course, we have different keys. Uh, what's going away is 62, what we're getting is 53. How funny, 61 to 54, 62 to 53. We're, we're narrowing in, we're, we're creating, or I guess we're broadening, we're broadening the band slightly. You know, it goes up on one side and down on the other. It's kind of a little silly note there. I don't know of any significance to that. But it is funny that we see the parallel of the um, 713, which are oppositions, of course. And then we see the 61 move to the 54 on one side and the 62 move to the 53 on the other. Just kind of funny, that's all. So let's read just a little bit about the leader. I have my trusty complete rave I Ching. And so we're just gonna read a little bit about leadership here, what they have to say what Ra has to say. Seven, the gate of the role of the self. Part of channel 31.7, the alpha. For good or bad, the design of leadership. I like that he put good and bad and scare, quote, scare quotes there. The seventh gate is part of the Sphinx cross. It is a gate of logical direction. This is the gate of the role of the self in interaction. The channel of the alpha is a design of leadership. It is the understanding circuit which leads us into the future. It is a rule of all forms that only logic, only the tested and established patterns can be followed with any certainty. Below in the line keynotes, it is clear how the nature of these leadership roles are determined. 
What is significant is that the self is unaware. The role is genetic and mechanical, and it does not respond to a concept of role. An authoritarian will always be one regardless. However, the conditioning power of this gate is enormous and has had profound effects on our collective history. The 31 may have the influence, but the direction and role of the seven is all too often the power behind the throne. Bill Clinton with his 31 and Hillary Clinton with seven, or Nehru's 31 and Gandhi's seven. Classic examples of democratic role conditioning. Seven, the point of convergence. By design, the need for leadership to guide and order society. And here's where we get some pretty familiar keynotes for people who know um, the collective roles. We have you know, the sixth line collective role, the administrator, the fifth line collective role, the general, the fourth line collective role, the abdicator, and so on. Which these are the externalization roles, by the way, for the collective. Which simply means that this is what is externalized, this is what's put out into the world, not necessarily what is meant to be absorbed. So, or how they take in things. You know, the first line, listening to you, is not supposed to be an authoritarian. They're supposed to listen as the empath. That's their internalization role. Um, but all too often, people get that backwards, and they externalize what should be kept to themselves, and uh, they internalize what should be advertised. So, so gate seven, the point of convergence. So this is really, this is again, this is leadership. This is what kind of leaders are we looking for in this era? What kind of democratic leaders, I should say? Uh, you know, what kind of logical leaders? It's an interesting, um, Teo Montoya pointed out last week at our Human Design Catalyst that you can look at presidents and you find far beyond statistical norm Gate 45 represented in the Republican Party of the United States, and then 7 or 31 represented in the Democratic Party. So it's just, just interesting, the, the red-blue divide there. Of course, I'm less interested in red and blue and more interested in the black and the red, the only divide that really matters. The personality and the design. But um, yeah, so this is, this is basically logical leadership. This is making predictions. This is like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Don't Look Up, where he's telling everybody, hey, there's an asteroid coming. You know, this is logical, it's predictive. And it's saying, this is what's going to happen in the future. Well, there's no precedent for it. There's no experience of it. I mean, that's what's difficult. Um, it's never happened before, oftentimes, what they're predicting. Uh, you know, so, they can predict it based on the modeling, but not based on being able to point to actual past experience, and certainly not able to weave together a story. Logic is not about the story, you know, logic is about the formula. And that same formula can be interpreted very different ways. That same formula can have different meanings and different interpretations, and this is where the abstract comes in. But overall, I think what it's saying is that you know, for the past 400 years, we've looked for a certain kind of leader. We've looked for a leader who has gate 62, right? We've, we've looked for a leader who is a leader through details, through opinions. Um, you know, let's look at 62 here. This is what we've looked for in our leadership. We've said, you have leadership potential. You can lead us into the future. You can make accurate predictions. You can ensure our safety into the future because you're so detailed. 62, the gate of detail. Ah, excuse me, looks like we had a little uh, issue on the camera here. I'm going to switch out. Um, I have another camera real quick. Adjusting the camera. All right, so yeah, excuse the excuse the little bit of uh, weirdness there. Okay, <laughs> that's better. Okay, so continuing on. So this is what we've looked for in leadership. We've looked for the detailed leader. We've looked. We've trusted those who can provide the details. 
We've trusted people who are organized. Part of channel 6217, acceptance, a design of an organizational being. This gate of the throat center says, I think. It is not the opinions of 17 that speak, but the mechanical capacity for detail which communicates. That's interesting, because 17 is just so full of opinions. And, you know, there's definitely something to be said for the whole channel being indicated in some sense. So it's not that opinions aren't around. I mean, sheesh, we live in such a time of opinions where everyone has opinions and where we're all being encouraged to have opinions. And yet, this is what Ra is saying here is that it's not the opinions that make the, the, the throat speak here. It's actually the mechanical capacity for detail. The throat center associated in our biology with thyroid glands is our center for metamorphosis. This channel is the perfect illustration of this function. What is a visualization at the mental level is concretized in the throat. Opinion manifests as words. It is through this gate that the things, the formulas, are given their names. The fixing of names is the foundation of the Maya. So we've looked for leaders who can name it. We've looked for leaders who can describe it. I mean, look at Ra. He, he was a very detail-oriented leader, despite, I think, not having this gate in his chart. But if he wasn't able to deliver that detail to us, we would probably be very skeptical of a lot of what he said. And if he wasn't able to create so many new names and so many new, new words. The 62nd gate is manifestation through detail. This drive for detail can become compulsive. In order for the collective to understand its world, everything must have a name. The quality of the opinion is always dependent on the ability to detail the concept logically, not the concept itself. I think is not I do. The concept of how things should be organized must face the crucible of testing, repetition, and experimentation. This is the gate of the development of language and the common ground for sharing the human experience. So we've wanted leaders who are able to organize things and are able to test that organization to face the crucible of testing, repetition, and experimentation. We want you know, our leaders to have been through this trial. We want cautious, patient, detailed leaders. Cautions, patient, caution, patience, and detail produce excellence out of limitation. Preponderance of the small. This is the gate going away that makes Ra say, no one's going to know how to program a VCR in the future because all the programming of the VCR is so detail-oriented. Look at all the details. I mean, even the details that we get in our entertainment, like a TV show, has such incredible detail put into its special effects, put into so many different aspects of that. So starting in the sixth line, back in 1610, we had self-discipline, the development of self-discipline. Then we had metamorphosis, a reaching out to others to share or seeking acclaim through dramatic presentation. So this was in the, um, let's see, I have the numbers right here. This was 1684 to 1753. Humanity collectively was working on metamorphosis, was working on what to do with the details when they're complete. And then it led to a time of asceticism. I, I love reading these keynotes and trying to understand where they fit into that era. 1754 to 1822 is a time of asceticism, a perfected ascetic withdrawal in the pursuit of harmony and simplicity, or the urge to take action against established values that when restrained leads to withdrawal. So either way it's withdrawal. So there was a lot of withdrawal here, a withdrawal of leadership from 1754 to 1822, the Napoleonic time, sort of uh, the time of French Revolution, a time of asceticism, interestingly. I, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I would have thought of it, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess that it was ascetic in that it was going against the debauchery of the ruling class in France, for instance. And maybe other parts of the world may have been ascetic as well. For any viewers out there who are history buffs, please post any historically notable times and so on um, that, that you're interested or that you've noticed belong to one of these key periods and has some relationship. Starting in 1823 to 1891, we had discovery, a genius for the unusual, the ability to discover valuable information and detail work and to find innovative applications for this knowledge. I'll say, yeah, a tremendous amount of discovery happening in the 1800s. The detriment, a dissatisfaction with the monotony of detail work, the expression of dissatisfaction and boredom in detail work. 
right around the time of um, the Industrial you know, Revolution, too. That's interesting there. Then we get to the keynote of Restraint. This is the second line keynote, and this is from 1892 to 1960. The innate restrictiveness and discipline to comply with and exalt restraint. The discipline necessary for detail work. Think of all the detail work that was necessary from the end of the 19th century up to the mid-19th century. Tremendous detail work, but also the detriment. The intellect stymied by severe restraints, tending to anxiety and restlessness. The expression of anxiety and restlessness when faced with detail work. Finally, in our current era, line one, routine. The ability to transcend the boredom of routine through a rich and daring fantasy life. Neptune, and exaltation there. Or rebellion and its enormous waste of energy. The need for expression which ignores the details. So this is already just so interesting. We've seen since 1961 through 2027, or through 2026 into 2027, we can transcend the boredom of routine through a rich and daring fantasy life. So on the one hand, you know, our leadership needs to be able to imagine a different world. But it's called routine. So in a way, we are still trusting routine to lead us into the future. And that's about to change, right? Uh, now, the detriment of that we maybe have seen as well, rebellion and its enormous waste of energy. Since the 60s counterculture, there's been rebellion against everything. There's rebellion against rebellion against rebellion, fringe splinter groups and fragmentation of rebellions. And it is a tremendous waste of energy. It's the need for expression which ignores the details. And just how difficult that has been to see that there have been... Like a great example is um, true sidereal human design. Rebellion against human design. Richard Mason comes out saying human design is all a sham and he's rebelling against it but he completely ignores the details. He doesn't look at any of the details. And when I actually spent three hours with my 952 sitting with him, he, by the way, claims to have 952 because his sidereal chart has it. Not a chance, he was squirming the whole time. But anyway, when I kind of pinned him down and got him to sit still for a little bit and look at the details, everything fell apart. So we can see that the, the problem with the, the rebellions these days is that they, are so fixed on needing to express that throat, needing to get it out there, but it's ignoring the details. That's Mars bringing it out. But Neptune, the ability to transcend the boredom of routine through a rich and daring fantasy life, and the ability to organize the detail through fantasy. I mean, that is beautiful to me. That is so interesting just to see, you know, I'm in a profession as a computer engineer that has a tremendous amount of detail work, and I see that. I see that there's a transcendence of the boredom of routine through rich and daring fantasy life in computer programming and in detail work. I see that a lot. I see a lot of these programmers who are full of fantasy even though their day job is routine and boredom. So yeah, it's interesting in looking out through our history of how we've moved from self-discipline, metamorphosis, asceticism, discovery, restraint, and routine. I mean, there's a story here. It's telling the story of the last 400 years of how we collectively developed self-discipline or learned the lesson of self-discipline, more or less. I mean, obviously, at any given time, there's going to be the exalt and the detriment, and, you know, there's going to be the best and the worst all taken together. I mean, this is macro level. And I don't mean to say that um, we personally have learned this. I just mean at a collective level, the collective unconscious has gone through that period of self-discipline where the exalted side of it was detail as the path to material success. The detrimented side was having the skills but not the discipline to succeed, so lacking the self-discipline. So starting from 1615 to 1683, that was a tremendous time of learning material success through details, learning how much money can be made through details, how much you can succeed through details. Then we moved on 1684 to 1753. Humanity was collectively learning about metamorphosis. And it was basically learning that you have to finish the details before you can take action or express. If you're not done with the details first, it's going to go wrong. You know? and then, but you realize that when the details are organized, there is a need for attention, and it does demand expression. So this is, you know, this is the classic not-self theme of the undefined throat, demanding attention, looking for attention, trying to get attention. At a collective level, we were learning about when the attention is required, when the details are in place, 
then the expression can happen, then the attention can be attracted. Then we collectively went through asceticism, 1754 to 1822, a very ascetic time, the perfected ascetic withdrawal in the pursuit of harmony and simplicity, where outside dangers do not exist, and there's time to pursue inner meaning in detail. So this was a time of turning inward. Like I was saying before, tremendous uh, breakthroughs in philosophy around that time, romanticism, um, enlightenment philosophy, and so on. Discovery, 1823 to 1891, a genius for the unusual, discovering valuable information in detail work. I mean, think about the scientific breakthroughs that happened then. Uh, but also a lot of dissatisfaction and boredom kind of arising during that time. And then restraint, discipline to comply with and exalt restraint, discipline necessary. So again, like starting with self-discipline at the beginning, even more recently, you're still dealing with discipline and dealing with anxiety and restlessness. Intellect stymied by restraints tending towards anxiety and restlessness. This was 1892 to 1960, a very key time of psychoanalysis addressing anxiety and addressing the restlessness. I mean, it was um, von Franz who said restlessness is the modern condition and provisional living is the modern conditioning, you know, the modern condition. People who are restless because they're not really comfortable in their lives. They're waiting to begin a new life anxiety and restlessness when faced with detail work, and now in routine. Well, we're about to have that routine totally disrupted, right? Because from 2027 to 2095, we are getting <laughs> a different theme now. And actually for the next 400 years, we're getting gate 53. That's going to be our new leadership into the future, the new leadership that we're looking for. Gate 53, the gate of beginnings. The gate of beginnings. It's interesting because uh, as part of the plan, which is um, gate two, we're actually leaving behind gate 42, which is the harmonic of gate 53. 42 is the gate of endings. So we're in a time right now of endings. I mean, it's interesting when you see one of the keys, when the key of endings goes away and the key of beginnings comes in, right? That tells us that right now, our current era or the previous era, if you're watching this after 2027, it's the time of endings. And post-2027 is the time of beginnings. And what we want, how funny is this? We're moving from a logical key for logical leadership to an abstract key for logical leadership. This is the fuel of the maturation process. The sensing circuit is all about transition and change. The 53rd gate of development is the fuel of steadfastness. Yeah, this is part of the channel of maturation, a design of balanced development. This is steadfast energy. So we're looking for a steadfast leader, the energy to start a new cycle regardless of the changes that it brings. This is what we're looking for, someone who can really begin something new and be steadfast in that. Like the other format gates out of the root, this gate carries the potential of depression. The pressure is to begin and ultimately complete a cycle, but without definition to the harmonic, 42, there is only stress and frustration. This is an energy which is always seeking new beginnings. The entire sensing circuit demands patience. The pressure to begin is not an awareness, it is a mechanic. The pressure rides a wave. It is always present. The intensity to start one moment will fall away in the next moment. Wait and see. There is no sense starting what one is not going to finish. This defeats the entire purpose of the abstract process. And we can see that we're moving into the sixth line. There's the description for gate 53, development. Development as a structured progression that is both steadfast and enduring. So that's what we're being called to find. Where is the leadership that is steadfast and enduring? Where is the leadership that can bring something new regardless of that change? And ultimately, the sixth line is about phasing, exaltation, the successful utilization of the completion of a stage in development that by its evident success and value can be used as an example to attract support for the next stage. The energy to attract support for beginnings based on the success of the past, or a tendency in this position to hide success in the perverse fear that the success will either create excessive demands or supporters of the original process will end their support upon completion. The pressure to hide beginnings and fear of losing past support. <clears throat> so this is really saying, um, you know, we are here now, we're being tasked with in these coming years to find leadership that embraces the beginning and shows its successful previous launches, its successful previous beginnings, 
so that we can trust that it can continue on with this new beginning. Not the kind of leadership that is hiding um, you know, its past or hiding its new beginnings, I guess, not even the past, right? It just says, yeah, I was successful in the past, but I'm not gonna tell them about my new beginning because you know, they followed me there, but they might not follow me here. What it's really calling on is um, the energy to attract support for beginnings. And so a leader that can really stand out there and get the support by saying, look, I have a proven track record in beginnings. And look, I've made all these successful, you know, I, I can lead us into the future. I can lead us into the future through a new beginning. That's what's being called for. The old leaders say, you know, I can lead us into the future because I know the details. I can lead us into the future because I have the discipline to use the details for material success. I can lead us into the future because I embrace the restraint and embrace the limitation and all this stuff. Well, the new leaders are not, they're not gonna want that anymore. They're gonna say, we've had 400 years of leaders telling us they have the details. Look where that's gotten us. What we need is a leader who can actually start something new, regardless of what that change brings. So that is the leadership that we're really looking for in this new era. And it's, it's interesting, it's abstract leadership, you know, an abstract key for a logical lock. It's interesting. Do you have any of these gates? Do you have gate 62, uh, particularly gate 62, line one? Do you have gate 53, particularly gate 53, line six? I'd love to hear your experience with these placements. I'd love to hear, you know, if you have any other associations, anything, any thoughts at all, please post them in the comments. Thanks for watching.